so lambic updating code gen support view compilation but it's ongoing enabling c sharp 6 ongoing um, created content token for dynamic form submission and this one is created content so when you create a content item from the dynamic forms now you have a are, token which are you is sharing sebastian yes Mac. Uh, add created content token. So when you create a content item from a dynamic form, now you have a token with the value of the content item. Uh, makes more sense. Um, update class modified and by properties when replace media item. So it's updating the properties when you update a media item. Okay. The properties of the media item. Um, eagerly loaded extension. So these are extension methods if you want to uh, load eagerly some related um, properties. And and uh, Sergio did that automatically for the taxonomies to optimize the taxonomies. And what's happening now? I didn't double click. Um, so that's this change, making taxonomies faster. widget here too. So um, it's on a dev branch, merge one ten x into dev and then Peleg is pushing to dev like crazy. Uh, fixing auto merge errors, okay fixing the merge. Okay, missing file. Updating the csproj files which were added in the dev branch. Okay, good. And does it work? Yes, dynamic compilation is working. On 110x? And dev? The compilation isn't. Okay. So but when are we looking at doing a, a 111 release? You mean one ten three? Well, dev. Okay, you can do it. We can do one one dot eleven release. Not, yeah, no, don't I... do it. Don't do it yet. Don't do it yet. <laughs> okay. It was just that someone else, someone was asking me, um, and I haven't been too involved in Orchard this Orchard one. So can I down? Don't care about it. Um, so 111 we can't apparently Benedict says uh, 1103 we can yeah, that that one either not do it yet so what is broken so <clears throat> okay so uh, you know the PR that you uh, and the issue you commented to so the, basically the problem is that if we have dynamic compilation with C sharp 6 which is I think the best thing ever <laughs> or the second um, then it also means that if you try to use view compilation, then the view compilation process, when you know the um, the razor is is uh, translated or transpiled into into uh, C sharp, and then the C sharp is compiled uh, into uh, intermediate language, you know that process also wants to use Roslyn, which is um, I've read somewhere that act actually should be faster, uh, but the problem is is that. Currently, the the official um, package that is released by ASP.NET or or some other Microsoft team, uh, so the code that actually makes it available for you to use Roslyn uh, in your application, it, it's it's wired in the, the location to to the C sharp compiler executable is wired in, so it's always uh, relative to project uh, project root slash bin slash Roslyn slash csc.exe. So and and basically this uh, this this Roslyn package, which includes csc.exe, needs to be in all the projects that use uh, that use the, the compilation that way. So that's why I did the sim links, which is yeah, kind of looks like an overkill. So I don't know. So and my comment was was view compilation working before the PR. Yes. So, so yeah, dynamic compilation with C sharp six and view compilation work separately. Uh, the, the view compilation the, with Orchard before. 
and you come uh, well before I started working on it. No, it didn't. Yeah, it didn't work, and now it's, yeah. it doesn't. Sorry. And now it doesn't. Well, it doesn't again. Yeah, I think so. If I had to choose, I would choose dynamic compilation because it's a it's a more more useful developer feature. I mean, it it makes your life so much easier. Mm, but I'm not exactly sure, and I I need to test that that uh, use case as well. What happens? Uh, what happens with the just-in-time compilation when you deploy to a server? Okay, so, so you can still look, but just to show that what I what you're referring to, the, yeah. the CSC.exe file that you're referring to is that package an open source library? Uh, no, I, as far as I I didn't find it, find the source code for it, but it's it's but a NuGet package. It's a NuGet yeah. package. It's public. So and. Um, so for those who can see the screen, you see here in every project of every module, the the change that Benedict requires is to do that and execute RD, which is remove directory the folder and then create a sim link between the actual location of Roslin to the local folder on every project. So we are creating like 200 sim link or 100 mm -hmm. sim links. Just oh, I, know it's a new, I know yeah. it's a NuGet package, but is it not an open source package that we can change? It's not open source as, as far as I could find out. Do you know the team, Sebastian? The what? The Bean team or the Roslyn team? <laughs> the team that the team that made that package, Microsoft.net.compilers. Um, nope. The only information information as I know is what what is the chain set from from Roslyn that they are using that they are including in the NuGet package, and obviously Roslyn is open source, but it, but this package that actually defines where to find the executable after you use the NuGet package, uh, I I didn't find the source code for that. Uh, okay, so basically I think the the problem is is that probably if you deploy it to a server and you want to use just in time compilation. I think the same kind of problem would arise what we have now with with view compilation. So yeah, like I said, uh, if I had to choose, I would use dynamic compilation. But currently, it looks like uh, from 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 these errors is that probably uh, that's that's not an option. So we have if we have to choose, then it's it's going to be view compilation, and that's also use, useful as well. Because it gives you a way to to statically check your your razor code for errors, which I think is it's great. Yeah, this is what I found as well. So this is the branch that they're using two point four. Yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe we can just compile that and change or submit a PR to it and publish the package. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, well, it depends. But at least you can try to fix to fix the issue, which is it's hard coded. At least use an environment variable or a parameter or something. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So the only uh, the only solution I found is that there's actually there's a way to define um, a machine wide override for that. Um, but I don't think that's a solution. Yeah, ideally, by project we could or by the main that, project yeah, that properties and. It looks yeah, like there's a lot of issues around this anyway. 252 issues to do a CSC.exe. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah this approach it. with uh, all the sim links happening at runtime, or is it at runtime, or is it just at build time? No, no, build it, time. it's only compile time. It's only compile time. So if you Steve. if you use a specific build target or the, or you enable a specific switch when you compile the code, that's when the sim links are going to be created. Ah, uh, okay. So it wouldn't happen for everybody everywhere. No, no, no. no. Okay. Uh, the other thing I was thinking, is, since this kind of seems like a bit of a work in progress, and Benedek, you say don't do a one eleven re release until you've you fix some things up here. Maybe this should be moved to like a branch. Yes, uh, yeah. Now I agree. <laughs> but what? What? So we. So the view compilation is is was merged. I don't know earlier, and then or maybe now, and the dynamic compilation stuff was merged earlier, and uh, I just found out that they actually conflict. They are actually conflicting. Oh, I see. Do you have some American blood? Uh... Daniel? 
Sorry? Do you have some American blood? Blood? No, not that I know. Yeah. I, I love your passive aggressiveness. It's, it's, very, it's very American. What? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, oh, we, maybe we could use a branch for that. <laughs> well, if, if you think about that, you know, Daniel is Swedish, then he's kind of a, a son of a warrior nation. So I live in Germany now, so I'm only going to get worse. And I think really? It's more harsh. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. Oh, my life. Boy. But I didn't mean to be passive aggressive. I just I didn't mean you did anything. I just mean maybe <laughs> constructively we could move this into a branch. Yeah, now, uh, not... I agree. So uh, yeah, probably probably it would be best if you just reverted it and put it in a separate branch. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because I want I wanted to to connect back to what Nick was asking too. If we could do a one eleven release, um, it, there's actually a bunch of stuff in dev now that's never yep. seen the light of day. So uh, agree. Yeah, and I, I have two clients that have been asking when it's going to be released for quite a while. So it would be good to do one, I think, pretty much soon. Um, I think so. If if everyone agrees, if we can if we can find a way to to make it work properly, because if we if we manage to get it working in a in a way that everyone agrees that it that it's all right, then like I said, uh, as from what I've read, um, this kind of compilation could actually be some performance uh, upgrade to use uh, Roslyn instead of the old compiler. So if we manage to get it working, it would be really nice for a release. But of course, it, it, needs, it needs some more testing. So yeah, it, let's say that I don't know if we if we don't find a solution for this in one or two weeks, then we just revert it and, and make and, and do a release or something like that. That okay. would be good. And you will be responsible for the release. Boom. Me? Yeah, you failed. You failed us. You're responsible for the release. OK. OK, <laughs> no problem. But, but I'd like to ask for your help uh, in, I don't know, nope. finding someone in, nope. in, uh, in the ASP.NET team or something like that to see if they can. I have a name. It's not the ASP.NET team. It's the Roslyn team. Fred Silberger. <laughs> Silberger. Well, yeah, I can contact him. He looks familiar. I mean, I must have met him, but. Okay, we'll see. You're you're active aggressive, not passive aggressive. Oh my god! Like oh it. yeah. <laughs> you failed. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Um, good, 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 good. Uh, status. Uh, talking, talking, talking about shipping one ten and one eleven, but blocked by. Um, okay. A status, 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 status. Uh, that's it. On chat call. On chat two. On chat two. Virtual. Lots of commits. Then, then, then. Um, so lo lots of small fixes, like lots of last minute fixes, because every day I want it to ship. And every day I will say, okay, let's see tomorrow morning if someone found an issue, found, found an issue, and somebody found an issue every day. So, but today is, today is fine. Um, support X41 did host for tenants. So the idea is that uh, previously um, I was looking in the host header to resolve the um, domain for the multi-tenants. But actually what we should do is just do the dot .host um, here, okay? Oh, and yeah, this one actually is wrong. Uh, oh no, this is a PR, so forget about that, sorry. I will skip this and go there. Yeah, it's later, it's better. So dependencies, this is updating um, yes, SQL to allow for uh, queries to be done without any type. So it will just resolve the correct type dynamically. This is very important for um, dynamic queries uh, from the admin because you can't say what type you want to result return as a document. So yes, SQL will now look at the document colon and say, okay, you want this type of class. So let me create an object of this class. If you don't specify anything, like if you say object, it will be polymorphic. 
Um, then fixing field differentiator and documentation. So I think Antoine saw some issues. I didn't see Antoine. Yes, I see he's here. Um, so um, this was an issue, wrong field, so it was not working for differentiators, and the documentation was uh, um, wrong. It's the, the opposite, like this is field and this is part in the documentation, so this is fixed. Um, build display filter allow a J object input. So Jean Thierry optimized the display filter so we can either pass a content item object or a JSON document that represents a content item. And in this case, it will be initialized as a content item and passed to get the build display. It's interesting if you have a, um, an embedded content item inside a JSON document and you just want to get one and say, okay, give me the display text for this JSON object, which is a content item. Um, so that's, that's good. A build display, display text, and I think it did uh, one or two. Um, this one, yes, so and, and this was an old, so this was a wrong suggestion. So in this, uh, in this uh, commit, what I tried to do is try to read the X for wanted host header if it was provided or the host header itself if it was not, so that the proxies will be able to say, uh, I'm meeting you on this IP, but the original domain was this other one, and we need the other one. And this is why we need to use X forwarded host. But actually, uh, from a comment from um, Kevin Chalet, um, we don't need to do that because, and I talked to the guy who wrote it, um, because if you do dot use IIS integration, in your program of CS, it will register a middleware that will find this host, this header, and um, and automatically assign the host with the value of this header and not the host header, which means now we can just do, is it the actual commit? Yeah, so we can remove this line. This is not used. So we can just do dot .host. And if we are running behind a proxy, this will be the value of x forwarded um, for uh, yeah, x forwarded host. And if you are not running behind a proxy, this will be the host header. So this um, handling is done automatically. We just need to do request dot host done. Uh, and if we want to also, I, I put a, a note here. If one day we also to generate a URL based with the the protocol HTTP or HTTPS. We can also do just dot a scheme, and this also has the logic of converting it to using the dash proto uh, version of the header. It's very useful. Um, so update liquid template docs, so updating the documentation, which was wrong. This is a Nix branch, so I would just just jump there, fixing the make field default value. So default values were not working. So I tried to fix it by uh, checking the nullability, but uh, jean Thierry made me realize that uh, it was wrong. So then, then so yeah, you see this field that is new was an extension method to test if the content item was new, but it's very hard to test if a content item is new. So the, the only thing to, because it was checking the ID from database, but we have embedded content items also, which don't have uh, database IDs. So what I did is completely change how, well, completely. I did a parameter to, let me show you, let me show you to display, to I display manager. So when we build the editor, we can say if it's for a new item or for an existing item. And this way, the editors can assign default values, can do different things on edit and create just by this boolean. Okay, that's the idea. So when we build the editor or update the editor, then we have to say, or we can say, if it's a new item or not. Um, if you're adopting, just say it's a new item. If you don't know, but, some, but most of the time we can know. And then we had to change uh, the drivers which needed it, like the ones which require the default values. So that you can just say, is that the context for a new item? Yes, then use the default value. Otherwise, just take whatever the value is in the field. Um, and, and, and the controllers also are using that. And it's changed for the content item display manager and any other entity display manager, like user, query, um, and, and so on. 
side settings. Um, and that's it. There might have been some other um, commits to fix missing views where we are also using the build display provider, but that, that's fixed now. Uh, layer filter, fixing layer cache in admin. So the issue with this one is that if you changed a content item from the layer screen, you will not see the draft appearing if you created a draft because it was caching um, all the layers widgets. So you will not see the new versions of the, of the widgets. So now this is fixed. There is still some caching, but just for the front end, not from the back end now. Um, and correct invalidation. Fixing insert widget link, um, when you are editing a, a flow part, a flow page, the, um, there is a little drop down on each widget to insert another widget right before this widget. And this was not showing the correct editor. So this is just because of this boolean which was wrong. Uh, fixing the theme blog header, this is to fix a CSS property that was making the header of the blog uh, theme too small compared to a screen. If you have a big screen, if you have a small screen, or if you have a normal size screen, you will not see that. If you have a huge screen, like if you run on a Mac with a big screen like this, uh, you can't share on Skype and you will see that your blog theme will be super small compared to the size of uh, your screen. So now this is fixed. Um, yeah, this, yeah, just CSS things. Details, uh, missing quotes in layout. I'm uh, mixing some quotes here, you see. So it will work, but it's not correct. So I fix it. Uh, fixing field class names. Same thing, yeah, Antoine found that, yeah, I did, a ref uh, when I changed the numeric field, he found that, um, no, is another one. Yeah, so class names now are better because they were repeating the same thing again and again, like it was um, widget dash or field dash uh, numeric numeric. No, it's field dash numeric and then the name of the, the field. Okay, um, so this is fixed. Uh, image shape was not uh, the class names. Huh? Yeah, later, after. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah. This one, there are two commits, then you found this one. Uh, so image shape, what's the issue with this one? Um, yes, um, the media resize pro pro provider would manipulate the image even if we didn't have a query string to resize it. And by default also, there was a parameter of convert to PNG. So all your images will just be processed and converted to PNG, even if you didn't have resize. So now this is fixed. If you don't put any resizing, there will be no conversion and it won't try to resize to, to force it to PNG. That must have been from a previous bug, an old bug from ImageSharp that only supported PNG or something like that. Uh, and by the way, we updated ImageSharp to the latest, which fixes some issues with um, PNG files also. So that's it. Um, updating README to show that we are moving to beta and updated command line, uh, fixing field classes because copy pasting is bad. So you get all your classes with HTML field when you should not. Uh, fixing users display because I renamed the is new, I used um, parameter name, argument names, and I used the wrong one. So it was breaking the user's display and 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 uh, disabling corrugating. So this thing which was supposed to be an optimization, the corrugating on your SQL so that all the queries are not run again and again, but uh, wait for the same result, uh, was creating lots of um, looking contention and uh, decreasing the number of requests per second, making things slower. So right now I'm just disabling it until I find uh, the solution. So this is disabled now and it's faster. Well, it's as fast as before it was enabled. Um, and I will find why it's slow. Maybe just looking con contention that I, have to, I need to fix. Um, and the last one is a PR I created this morning from some feedback. Uh, we don't have to merge it for beta, uh, though it's pretty safe. The idea is that it's a new feature that um, will register a file provider not this one, I fixed also, uh, I removed an unused variable here, but a file provider, a static file provider, see it's a custom feature, file provider, that will um, 
um, provide files from a dub 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 root folder under app data slash tenant. The idea being that if you need to serve static files for specific tenant or custom content on the same static file based on the tenant, then you can do it. The example that the, the user gave was for the dot well dash known folder where you put your um, uh, for instance, in this case, it was an Apple application um, ID uh, credential. You have also to use it for, let's say, encrypt certificates. And these files, they are needed to, to validate that you own the domain. And they have a single file name. So if you have five domains under your um, tenants, then you can't uh, distinguish which, which um, certificate it is for. Um, or in the case of Apple ID, uh, which um, key it's for which uh, domain it's for. So with this thing, if you enable it on a tenant, only if you enable it on a tenant, then you can create, I documented it, you can create under your app data, um, dub dub group folder, and put any file on that. And when you access static files on this tenant, it will also resolve this folder, if none has been found at the higher level for all the tenants. Okay, it's a new feature. Uh, that's it. Questions? And I haven't seen any new issues, new bug, which was valid since Friday, I think. Well, Sunday I fixed it, okay, since yesterday. So we are good to ship. One last thing. We might want this thing. Dot ASP.NET Core dot so a few hours ago nick they released 201 um, which contains improvement fixes and security fixes um, we might want to get that it should not break anything it's a minor version just patches yeah there's a bug fix in that to do with forms that um, i need for the team i work on I personally more care more about the, the security fixes that are inside because it's also important not to ship something that <laughs> is outdated and has security issues. Um, we, the nice thing is that we can always point to a newer version if we want, uh, but yeah, maybe we want to, to do that. It's just It should just be about changing the version number. Actually, I tried to change our um, dot .props file where we set the unique version number we use for SPNet Core. The only issue is that um, they shipped some of them with 201 and the ones which didn't have to change, they didn't ship it. So we have 200 sub for some and 201 for some others. Um, this will be kind of painful because we had a single location to change everything. So there are some solutions. There are two solutions. There are two solutions. Uh, First solution is to use the dot all package. Do you know about the dot all package? The dot all package is a package that references everything ASP.NET with the correct version. And look at that. The dot, the dot all package is 203. Okay. And this one contains no code, but just dependencies on everything ASP.NET Core with the correct version. So you can see that localization abstractions is 201, but file same globing is 200. Okay, these are the latest uh, CMT package. This is like our CMS package is doing. Okay. So one solution would be to reference the dot all package, but from every module, and that can be bad for performance and uh, build time and also for deployment because it would deploy all the libraries even if, if we don't need them. Um, another solution is to use... So isn't there a trick? Didn't they make a... There's a trick where yeah. the libraries aren't included if so they're if, not required, if you not needed. Publish, if you publish uh. and use the .all, then it won't publish them because it knows that, well, if you publish a .all and, and the, the, the web hoster supports it, the shared runtime, then it won't deploy that. Azure supports that. But at the same time, you get a performance hit because they are, uh, they can't be, uh, 
uh, GTID and some method in line cannot work. So you get a 20% per feet if you do that. So I prefer not to use the dot all for now. The other solution, which you might prefer, is to use a file, um, a file which is named, I can find it. Um, I, I've used it by the past for some other projects. So there is a file which actually is a props file that references all the versions for all the packages. So let me show you. So if we look at, um, but to upgrade the packages that we've got, we only need to change it in one file, right? Oh, that's what I'm saying right now. We can't. Yeah. Be... No. Why? That's, that's what I'm saying. Today, we have one version, which is 2.0.0, okay? Yes. For everything. Now, the issue with this new oh. release is that they have 2.0.1, 2.0.0 everywhere, okay. one by one. So we, it will be a pain in the ass to do that, yeah, right? Yeah, that's a pain. Oh, there's uh, a dependency stop props file, isn't there? In exactly. The... Where is that? Did yeah. you find it here? It's in the it's in the MVC repo. Yes, in the MVC repo or somewhere else, um, there is a dependency dot prop file, and we have one already. Let me show. So if I go there, how come they did? I thought they were going to keep those two things consistent. I haven't asked Elon why he decided to do that, but they have reasons. Are you sure? That maybe they just. Uh, they, they have reasons. They know what happens. They know what's the implications of everything. They are clever guys. They decided to go with this way, probably because the other way had other issues <laughs> uh. that we don't see because it didn't go the other way. So SRC build, and we have a file where we put our dependencies of props, and we said, you see, ASP.NET Core version 200. And whenever we want to reference something from ASP.NET Core, we use this variable, dollar ASP.NET Core version. So we can change it in one place. But now, because they have mixed versions, it's we are broken because we can't change that. If we change that, either we break the dot, dot one or the zero. Um, so what we can do is use, they have a similar file, a dependencies the props file, uh, for the dot all package. So we could add this file in the same folder here, remove that, and update our CS approach files to use the dollar MVC core version, the dollar configuration version, and so on. So we'll do it once, and the next time they ship something, we can just update the versions uh, in this file, or update the versions by ourselves if we want. That's the, the solution I would suggest if you want to do that. So we still need to change the CS proj files, but at least we, we still externalize the, the versions everywhere. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, okay, maybe. It's painful, but it will take one hour and then it should be pretty easy. And if it restores, it works. That's, that's good. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, so that's it. Um, questions? No questions? Demo time. Okay, great. So show a chat. So this website was shut down uh, through, for a few months and was developed by another guy, Ryan. And uh, now it's uh, live again. And it's maintained by Lombic Technologies at the moment and it's running on .nest. Um, I don't know if anyone uh, doesn't know this website, but it's about uh, showing representative uh, websites that was uh, powered by Overchart CMS. Uh, you can filter them by categories, or you can read some interesting or funny stories by developers. Uh, these interviews can be found here. So. That's all for the website. It's pretty simple. And uh, some a few words uh, about uh, the code. So as I mentioned, it's uh, on .nest. So I had to uh, write some liquid, some Orchard 2 developers may be familiar with this. Um, because they are using a good engine, not a bad engine. <laughs> OK, maybe. Uh, but it, it was really fun developing it, actually, um, especially this one, this, uh, this main menu. But, but it's working and it's great and uh, almost, um, almost the same 
result than it was before. Some some uh, parts of it uh, maybe change. For example, the pager. I don't have pager so here. So you rewrote it. Uh, rewrote the the um, shapes, but the styling is the same. So these okay. files, these uh, less file less files are um, ninety nine percent of uh, the you, first. You, you did that because it's on .dot .nest and you can't push the views you want. That's it. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Trace files. Files. I see. I see. I see. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ready? So I tried to uh, reproduce the CHTML files, but it's it's only the small part of them. It was enough uh, to achieve, and um, and yeah, um, it's pretty much the same. Some things are different, but but uh, they are really uh, tiny changes. For example, the pager or or um, I don't know. Maybe maybe this is one. The only thing that is different, the the what is this footer is different, but but yeah, it's it's the same. That's good. Um, yeah, actually, it's open source. Of course, it's using the media theme deployment, uh, which is the uh, feature for deploying this kind of liquid packages for .dot nest. You can you can uh, check this website. So I will type paste these links to the chat. Here. Great, thank you for handling that. That's yep. great. We talked about it a, f a few weeks ago, like it was done, and we wondered why. So that's good. Yeah, probably um, with the Zoltan. And okay, good, good thing. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now we can put it back on the website. And uh, yeah, we are talking about it because um, yeah, on the main website, we are using some of the pictures which were there. And I used the web archive to get the pictures, but now I have the original one, which is good. And yeah. you might want to add an, I don't know if you can do that, APIs to be able to get the latest ones or something like that. Later, we have time, but at some point, that would be good to be able to have, a, to have an endpoint to, to grab some value. Yeah, yeah, on a related is. note, I think there was a there's a branch um, in the in the repository about uh, content deployment. Is that still alive, or that that could be one way to you know synchronize content between those two sites? Content right. deployment. Yeah, I think there was something. Uh, maybe Bertrand was working on it. I'm I'm not sure. Oh content yes, deployment. Yes. Yes. Hmm. What about it? But it's not an yeah. API. It's just we have to export the content. No, uh, but I'm just asking whether it's is uh, sure is that something that that is usable or needs some more development to be able to release it or something like that. Uh, I think it was working. Finished was in a Bertrand. You did quite well, a lot of work. Right? It. We can merge yeah, it. it was, merge yeah, it. It was it, it, it was done. So yeah. merge it. it was ready. Uh, One stop has been using it, I believe, for years. Okay. That it was built for them originally, I, I think. I oh, thought okay. someone else built it originally and maybe you took over it. No, I think he, he did that. Maybe? Oh. Uh, I, um, I think I reused code from somebody, but uh, I, I built most of it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so Do someone from, from Lombic will try it and uh, merge it. Yeah, we could we could um, probably include it in in the Good. next release. That would be really nice because Good. we have been asked about some. So different people were were asking us about uh, uh, different kinds of features related to synchronizing content, and they all pretty much point into the same direction. And probably all those use cases are covered by this module. Try it. That would be nice. You're the new owner. Good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and and it's, it's interesting because a month ago we talked about how to get ownership from some uh, other modules and and you are the good example thank you Benedek, for ending that oh, um, <laughs> glad to be of service <laughs> um, good 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 great nick thank you mark that's a great job thank you, thank you very much cool so i've been doing a little bit more graphql stuff um so i'm going to demo uh what i've done around queries in graphql so as you guys all know oops let me just go to admin screen. It's beautiful. Here's a website I started earlier. Um, let's see. Okay, cool. Um, so we have a thing called queries in in Orchard. So when you start up using a default block recipe, this is all it is: a default block recipe. 
you get a recent blogs um, uh, query. So if I load that up, um, I can see that. And then if I, uh, if I go and run it, you can see that we get a list of blogs. But there is a new text box. Later. Um, <laughs> cool. So you can see that we've got a new, we've got, we got a query. It's given us items back, and you can see that I've got some display text and I don't know a content item ID, and that's kind of groovy. But um, I'm just going to see if I can hide this. Oh, okay. Click, click once and don't touch it. Okay. Okay. There we go. Um, so I want to get the, this back through GraphQL. So if I pop into Postman, um, we have a new endpoint. So I've got GraphQL forward slash GraphQL forward slash schema. Um, so what this will do is it will get my, my GraphQL schema back that you can use to query against it. So if I hit send just on a get request, this is going to provide me a lot of stuff. Um, all my graph, all my objects, all my content item objects, um, everything. Um, allow me to query. So you can see that an article in this instance is made up of a title part and a body part and an order out part. Um, and you can query on those things, etc. Um, and say, I want that Mac. Um, but what I've done is, uh, oh, here we go. So you've also got a type of query. Now, the type of query means that I can query particular uh, specific content types, such as blog post and liquid page and blog and all those kind of niceties. But the other one I've got um, that I've int introduced into here is the notion of named queries. So um, when you're querying for a blog, you can also be querying for a recent blog post or sorry, recent blog posts query. So that when you're looking at GraphQL, the notion of queries and kind of querying for blog, uh, querying for content items, they're, they're kind of symbiotic. They're kind of the same thing, even though the implementation under the hood is very different. Um, so in this instance, I've got a recent blog post and this returns me blog post. And we know that because if I go back to here, I can say, I can see that my term that's being returned is a blog post. Um, if I look at the, here, my query term is a blog post and I'm always returning content items. So, I mean, let's, let's make a, let's run a query against that. So I can say, um, if I go to here, recent blog posts, oops, recent blog posts, um, and I want to say I want the ID of the of all my blog posts back. So I can run that, and I can I've got my ID back, and it doesn't really tell me anything. Content um, item ID. You should always use content item ID. Yeah. Or this, we can this. do content item ID as Sebastian asks, and again that doesn't really tell me much, but it says that I've got four. E, Z, Y, and if we look at here for E, Z, Y, so, you know, we, you know that we've got the data coming back, um, which is quite nice. Now, what's interesting about this is that um, with, hold on, I thought you were watching the game, Sebastian. I switched. Oh, okay. So what's nice about this is um, because I know the content type that's being returned by the query, I can also say at the same time, well, because it's returned me a blog post, I can now start saying, well, I want the title of the blog post back too. So you can start seeing that I've now got a title coming back of the title part. And you can also start saying, well, you know, um, I also want the path of the auto route part back. This one I actually haven't tried. Um, Try brace. Let's see. Pardon? Curly brace. Curly brace, yeah, that's right. I wanted the um, the uppercase A. And you can see that you, you've got the nice niceties of um, uppercase um, uh, validation on there. Did you mean? Don't you have a, a client? Don't you use a client that has IntelliSense or auto-completion, sorry? Uh, I'm just using... Um, that would uh, be Postman nice to, to see it because there are clients who do that. There, there, yes, there is a graph, um, uh, an iGraphQL client. I haven't um, installed that yet. Um, maybe, maybe I'll demo that next time. Thank you. 
But um, in this instance, so you can start seeing that I'm saying I want uh, all my all my content items back, and I only have this particular set of information coming back because that's the information that I've specified, which is quite nice. Now the next part is um, is well, okay. So I'm returning content items back, and that's quite nice. Um, uh, what if I wanted to add a new query? How does that kind of fit into this this new world? Um, so that's kind of cool. So let's add a query, um, and the name is let's just call it test query for now. Um, and we've got a new text box called schema. Um, now, schema allows us to do something like this, um, where we specify the items that we are going to get back. Actually, I think this. No, I think this should work. Um, so we specify that uh, I have a content item ID, ID and. Uh, a string, and these are the only. This is the only item I'm going to be returning on my Lucene query. Um, regardless of the data that comes back, this is the only stuff I can show. So if I save that and run that, um, you can still see this is coming back here. Ignore that for now. Um, but what's interesting is if I jump into my schema, I can see that I've got a new thing called test query. And that's got a object of test query. So the schema is one-to-one -one with the type when you aren't returning content items. They have to be because every query can be different. No two I, queries can be the it same. Was not, it was not obvious. It was obvious because I, I wrote the checkbox, but the return content, return document on the first query, the recent blog post had the checkbox return document. Ah, return okay. content items. Yes, That's return content return items. Documents. Sorry, the return documents is equal query. Yeah, right. So, so this because of this checkbox, you could infer the schema of a content item, and Absolutely. you magically, which I don't really like it, but magically, so it was a blog post. Yes. Uh, and then you know what you knew what what. Uh, schema was used, but now in your new query, your test query, you didn't check that, so you are just returning a raw Lucene fields. So exactly. this is why you have to specify the schema. Exactly, because you don't know what's going to be returned, and with GraphQL, you have to have a schema up front mm -hmm. in order for the valid, in order for it to pass validation, um, or else it just will not know what you are telling it. Um, so you can see I've got this test query here, and that's quite nice. That's that's so here. What you didn't mention also is the format. It's JSON mm -hmm. schema and not GraphQL schema. Why? That's a very good point. So um, the GraphQL schema is is nice, but I mean, look, we have a we have a JSON document here. Why not just stick with the JSON document within the schema and make it very similar to each other? In this instance, we've got a query, and up in here we have a. Okay. So my reason it. was that it's because Lucene queries, SQL queries, or foo queries don't have to know about GraphQL. They can just know about JSON schema. And well, also so this we... this isn't JSON API either. It doesn't. Neither of the two conform to a particular schema type. Um, they are just whatever we want them to be, which is good. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, so one thing to note is that in here, when I'm saying I've got content dot content item dot content item ID, uh, GraphQL has um, doesn't allow funny characters. So as in a dot. Dots a funny character to it. Mm -hmm. So I have to normalize those to be underscores. So inside the inside the test query, which is the thing that we return, it will be underscores, which sucks. But yeah. um, so if I do test query, if I change this to test query, and let's say I change this to test query and I run it, you can see there's a lot of validation errors, which is expected. Yeah, um, that, you know that will change. What this? The, the, the Lucene that returns dots, uh, I will refactor it so that actually you will be able to, yeah, it's off topic, but we, you will define what you want to 
index and not just That's what cool. information you will be able to con to change the value and also what field you want to expose it to. So this way we won't have this automatic content dot content name dot content item ID. It will be a, your name, the name you want to be when you create the index. Well, that's nice. That would be good. Um, but uh, yeah, no, totally. That would be really decent. Uh, but in this instance, you can see that I can get the content right. item ID back. And if I add another field in, for example, you know, it's not going to pass validation because it doesn't exist on the on the test query, which is um, which is quite nice, actually. And the same piece of code applies to SQL queries, too. So return documents, returns content items um, and vice versa. So works quite nice. Still a bit of work to do on the query side of things. Um, it only supports string and integers at the moment because I haven't added any extra types. But uh, yeah. Can you go back to your schema in GraphQL? And no, in the, in the Postman, the schema result of the GraphQL query. Oh, yeah, it's not very nice at the moment. There's, um, no, I need to go up. So, this image paragraph for HTML page, what are the parameters inside? Here? Yeah. Ah, yeah, so these are all the content uh, content item parameters. But to filter. They're all optional. But it's a filter, yeah. And they are based on the content item in index? They are not based on an index yet. In memory? They are based in memory. So we, have, yeah, okay. we have had the discussion right before, okay? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, it will be in the, at some point, you will also support the indices, the, the, yeah, the SQL indices to be able to. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, you, don't, you don't have to. You can just, hey, create a query and go. go. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the queries, you can see that they were super fast. They were only yeah, one. I, yeah, I don't, I don't like it at all. I prefer it not to be there at all than to be there because people will use it and they won't understand that, yes, it loads all your content items and then will filter in memory. So it will just yep. be painful. Yeah, the, so it's interesting. Even if you use a, an index, any additional filters that are done afterwards still require all the items to be loaded. Uh, yeah, it, it's odd. I, um, I'm going to go back and re revisit. Okay. This this area of things later, but it works at the moment, so which is kind of nice. Okay, and it's fast. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, questions? Oh yes, I wanted to mention that website I forgot last time so we have um, do you want to present I am already presenting uh, so three one for Denmark so they are qualified for sure and 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 um, that's and an orchard site that's an orchard site and ah oh, crap equalized one one um, yeah, this one is an orchard site. So we have the Antoine's website already. We, we've seen that uh, two weeks ago, devotees. Inolabs.me, another orchard site. Orchard Core? Yep. The guy is um, this one. I don't remember his name. Let me see. Issues. Closed. This one, Dodig. Oh, okay. Dodi, Dodi, from Egypt. Yeah, his website, front page, and also a blog. And so, which leads me to talk about something, which is that, how do we know it's Orchard website? Yeah, the generator. It's not there. Huh? Because apparently, he's not using the resource manager in his theme. He's just pointing to, the, his theme doesn't use a resource manager. That's it. So we can't inject it. And uh, but it is using Orchard because look at that. It's a media folder, so it's like a hint. And if I go on the URL and I do with equals to forty, okay, I can resize it. Then you will say, oh, it's a big security issue because I can type anything and full is full uh, and make his disk full. No, it's a limited set of values that are enabled. You can change by configuration, but uh, we have a limited set of values, like six or seven values possible, 
possible. Um, so that's how we limit the DDoSing of this feature. Um, then, uh, so it's not using the resource manager. So I'm suggesting that we move, instead of using a resource manager, we're using a header. I don't know why we use a resource manager. Maybe we should look at the video where we talked about that. But here we see we can't see it's altered. That's, that's kind of an issue. Personally, for me, it's an issue that we can't find. It. So if we can at least do it like everything else is doing. Uh, so if it's I look at that, nice. you see export, adding an export by then add an orchard there. I think we had that at some point. I don't know why we moved it. Maybe for performance reasons, but it's not really an issue for performance reasons. So that might be better if the body disagrees, then we can do that. No, I agree. We'll, I'll check with uh, Fred what we can do. And, uh, and, and, and that's it. Questions? Everyone's happy? Do you know uh, what PYG is working on? She raises a lot of issues on Orchard. First, you assume PYG is a she. It's only based on the picture. So you should not assume. Uh, like, I've seen your picture. Sometimes you can't assume. Um, <laughs> then, um, a website. And third, um, we don't know. So ask. Ask them. OK. If you need that was all. No, I have no idea. We'll see okay. when it's published. Like uh, Duddy. Duddy is a nice guy. There's also uh, this guy. Um, um, what is this guy? This person. Oh my god, I'm freeing into the same issue. This person. Who is this person? Um, what's name? I will. I will. I will, I will, I will, I will. It's doing good stuff, apparently, and also pull requests and everything, so that's good. I don't know what, what they're working on. Uh, you know, there is a picture, but I don't know if it's a man or woman. I have issues here. Okay. Good. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. <laughs>